I hope your Bible is open to Ephesians chapter 2. So if not, please find that book again. Thank you, Jim, for reading the text today. So uh, I hope to get through a third of a verse today. So, <laughs> so uh, we'll do our best. This is, uh, we come to the section in Ephesians that um, I would say sets the tone for the rest of the book. And so we're, we're going to take a deep dive into it. By way of introduction, uh, last week we, we finished chapter 1 and we looked at three, th- th- uh, three thrill, hey, try to say that, three thrilling truths that we ought to pray that we would understand. That is, Paul said at the end of chapter 1, that we would know the hope to which God has called us, the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints, the fact that the people that he saves become his inheritance. Think about, you know, keep thinking about that. And, And then the immeasurably great power toward us who believe. And so we finish that, and then we come to chapter 2, and it's tempting to think that Paul has started a new thought. In fact, the chapter divisions in our Bible actually are not inspired. And sometimes that works for us just as a help to understand the flow of thought. And sometimes it may obscure uh, the thought of the writer in understanding what he's saying. And I'm not suggesting that it's an, an, the thought is obscured. But what I am saying is, as we enter chapter 2, actually, Paul's thought about God's power continues. So last week, we ended with talking about this incredibly immeasurable great power toward us who believe. And we said that uh, God is omnipotent. The Bible declares God's omnipotence and that there's nothing too hard for God. Uh, You can't measure omnipotence you can't come up with what's the most difficult task for omnipotence. The only way we can measure it is by thinking of those things that bring the most glory to the one who is omnipotent. And so Paul does that, and he says that there's there's nothing too hard for God, but that God's power at work, uh, the, the kind of power that's at work toward us is the kind of power that raised Jesus from the dead, seated Jesus at the right hand of the Father, and where uh, all rival authorities in heaven or on earth are put at Jesus' feet. And Paul's point there is that God's so powerful that he has subjugated all of the universe at the feet of Jesus. That's where we left last week. And it looks like, when we begin chapter 2, that now there's a new thought. But it's not a new thought. What, what, what's going to happen now at chapter 2 is Paul's going to give us another illustration of the power of God. And what he's going to do, he's going to paint a picture of us, who we are, and that's verses 1, 2, and 3, about the devastation that sin has brought into the human race. And then he's going to say, in, that notwithstanding... How, how we have been uh, cast into sin because of Adam's sin, even in spite of that ter- terrifying position, God is, has brought his power to bear upon us so that we, along with Jesus, that is, believers, the, those who have put their faith in Jesus, have been raised from the dead seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. So in other words, it's another illustration of God's power. God has displayed his power not only in Jesus, raising him from dead, seating him at the right hand of the Father, and giving all authority to him, but now we, who were dead in sin, uh, Paul says later in this, this section, But verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, Jesus was dead, God raised him up. Verse 4, even when we were dead, uh, verse 5, he has raised us up, and and verse 6, he has raised us up and seated us with him 
and the heavenly places in Jesus. So that is a display of God's power. And so this morning, what we want to do is understand the depths of our sin, because that, when we understand that clearly, we will then understand the power that God exercised in Christ to therefore raise us up and be seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. There's a whole lot in these 10 verses. This is why I'm saying we're going to slow down a little bit and we're going to take our time because uh, we'll take several weeks to look through this so we can understand and unpack all that Paul is saying. I want you to see, the title of the message is, is the transformation that, that God brings, the, the radical transformation. And I want you to understand, look at, if you look at verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, it says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked, which is an interesting kind of paradox, dead people walking. You were dead and you were walking. But then I want you to see verse 10. Keep in mind the word walk. So before Christ, we're dead people walking, dead in our sin, walking in, in those sins. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should what? We should walk. You see, so God transforms us from people who are living in spiritual death, walking in sin and trespasses, so that now we are, instead of walking in them, we are now walking in the path, the good works that God has prepared for us because he has redeemed us and then he has given us a path to walk on. So he's, this, is, this is radical, radical transformation from walking in sin and death to walking in good works before God. Not works that we say, oh, they earn our salvation, but good works that come as a result of salvation. So radical transformation that God does, taking dead people, making them alive, is putting God's power on display. Now, so this morning, we're going to, in this idea of radical transformation, that's why it says in your outline, in the bulletin, part one, okay? Because there are going to be several parts to this. But this is part one. And we start today with dead men or people, humanity. We're not just talking about the male gender, but humanity, dead humanity, spiritually dead, walking in sin. And this is going to be bad news uh, most certainly, uh, as we look at this, this is going to offend our sensibilities uh, uh, about ourselves. Uh, I'll just warn you now, okay? Uh, I can tell you it's not, it wasn't easy to study because it, it reminds me of who I am, who I was, and what God had to do to save me. Uh, so this is not a pretty picture, and yet it's important that we, we take it in hand and we understand it. We're going to take our time looking at these things. Now, uh, verses 1 to 3 are the, uh, the bad news about us, that uh, we're dead in sin. And then verses 4 to 10 talk about the good news. I said uh, a year or two ago, I used this phrase, the good news isn't good until the bad news is understood. And that is important to remember. The good news becomes so good when we realize how, how bad the bad news is. So verses 1 to 3 is, is really a diagnosis. Uh, verses 1 to 3 is our, yours, my moral history. This is you. okay? And... and like I said, it offends our sensibilities. This is the most politically incorrect thing that we could possibly say in our culture today. Because the culture says, you're good, you're, you're great, all that. You know, and, and here's what God says to us about us. This is his diagnosis. This is our moral history. And you 
were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So that's a reference to Satan, the spirit who is now at work. Verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. It's God's diagnosis of us. It has been said that a right diagnosis is half the cure. A right diagnosis is half the cure. I don't want to take medicine for an illness I don't have while my true illness runs through my body to kill me. I need to know. Sin has shattered humanity. And until we come to grips with that, until we come to grips with verses 1, 2, and 3, until we really understand this, we will miss the grace of God. And instead, we'll accept the deluded notion that each one of us is basically a good person, deserving of God's favor, and that by our own efforts at being better, we can earn a relationship with God. Oh, sure, I'm not perfect. I understand that. You heard people say that. But, but, but I'm not a bad person. And the Bible says, this is our moral history. And we cannot, therefore, earn a relationship with God. But a clear grasp of what sin has done to humanity, if we understand these verses, it will drive us to Jesus It'll drive us to Christ and a Christ-filled life. That's what will happen. That's what occurs when we, when we grasp and we accept the, the diagnosis, what's wrong with us. So, in, this, in these three verses, God gives us three aspects of our moral history. This diagnosis has three parts. And we're only going to look at one part today. I told you, I, I don't know how else to handle this. But I, I want us to get this, okay? So, like I said, we'll slow down. But I want you to know the three parts of the diagnosis. The first part is, is what we call, we're spiritually dead. Theologians call it total depravity. The second part, which we'll, Lord willing, get to next week, is slavery to sin. And then the third part is that we are, uh, without, apart from Christ, we are under condemnation. That is what God says about us. Other than that, we're in great shape. So the Old Testament, total depravity. I want you to see what the Bible says about us. Paul said you were dead. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. So it, what does the Old Testament say about this? Well, uh, I'll, you won't have time to look up all these references, but I, I will share them with you, and you can write them down and look at them later. But Solomon, King Solomon wrote, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, and in the ninth chapter, in the third verse, we read that Solomon said, but the Holy Spirit led Solomon to write, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. Now, toward the end of Solomon's life, he pursued women and money, instead of wisdom in an effort to satisfy himself. And Ecclesiastes, believe it or not, is his journal. He kept a journal of his life. He detailed how life is empty apart from God, even if it's filled with every kind of pleasure. And he concluded that every person's heart is full of madness or insanity, unable to discern the right course of action. That's what, that's what Solomon concluded. What about one of the prophets, Jeremiah? Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? 
You see, humanity's lust for sin is so deeply embedded in our human nature, we don't even have the ability to grasp how deeply sin has corrupted us. We can't even grasp the full weight of it. This is what happens, though, when you do come to know Jesus, when he does put his finger on you and touch you and and bring you to himself you do come to understand a little more. And as you actually grow in Christ, what happens is you actually begin to see more of your corruption and and you wonder, how could you have saved me, God? What is wrong with me? And we realize all along that we haven't yet plumbed the depths of the of the corruption of our own heart. That's why Jeremiah says, It's deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? God can. And he he knows what to do about it. But we really can't grasp the depths of our depravity. What about a king? King David. We heard from King Solomon. We heard from a, a, a prophet. Another king wrote, King David, wrote in Psalm 51, 5. I told you it was going to be bad news. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother did conceive me. Now, David is not saying that the act of conception is, was sinful. Not, no, that's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is that the sinful nature of our first parent, Adam, was passed on to David at the moment of conception. There never was a time. There never was a time when his existence was apart from his relationship to Adam, who sinned, and we sinned in him, actually. Uh, One of the books I consulted this week, which I highly recommend, New Life in Christ by Stephen Lawson. Stephen Lawson is uh, a force of nature. Uh, he's an incredible writer, incredible preacher, and in his book, New Life in Christ, he said about this idea of, of in, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin, my mother did conceive me. He said that in David, a, a preset, preset bent toward evil was passed down from David's forefather, Adam. And this is not only true of David, but of every person ever conceived. Well, that's the Old Testament. The Old Testament clearly portrays our own depravity, our own corruption, our deadness in sin. But the New Testament even comes clearer. The New Testament describes in a little more detail what sin has done to the faculties of our soul. Those faculties are our mind, our emotions, and our will. That which makes us a person. We are a people because we have a mind, we have emotions, and we have a will. And so we are people. And the point that the New Testament makes is that there is not one part of us that has been untouched by sin. Now, this is where we need to to clarify what it means when we say total depravity. Usually what people mean, or what they think, what they associate with the words total depravity is like Hitler and Mussolini or Stalin or some, you know, wicked uh, uh, person that attacks children, etc. Now, that person is depraved. They are expressing their depravity. But total depravity doesn't mean that you or I act as bad as we possibly could. Total depravity means that there isn't any part of our being, our mind, our emotions, or our will that have escaped the corruption that sin has brought. So for instance, what about our minds? Okay. Sin darkens the intellect of every person. Just jot this reference down, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. 
he is not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. So Paul, in that text there, is describing a person who's not born again. They're not a believer. They don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And before coming to Christ, they live in spiritual darkness. They're unable to see the truths of the gospel. So it doesn't mean they can't think. It means they can't see spiritual truth. But this is why a person, we can put people on, a moon, on the moon. We can do calculus. We can learn four different languages, at least some people, right, other than their mother tongue. But that same person who has an incredible intellect cannot grasp gospel truths. And so uh, John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said, unless a person has been born, uh, has the new birth, they cannot see the kingdom of God. They can't grasp it. They can't see it. It's, this is the intellectual effect of sin. It, it doesn't mean we can't think, but it means spiritual truths are hidden from us. Our minds are unable, apart from the intervention of the Holy Spirit, our minds are unable to comprehend gospel truths in a saving way. And that's just the mind. What does the Bible say about our emotions? Well, John 3, 19, Jesus said, this is the judgment. Light has come into the world. And people loved, they loved the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. Sin has so corrupted us that we love the wrong things. We people get angry and oppose those things which are right in God's sight. And they love things that God hates. Why is that? Because sin has defiled their emotions. But that's not all. It's not just our intellect. It's not just our emotions. But it includes our will. Left to ourselves. Our wills refuse Christ. Again, jot down this reference. Romans 3, 10 and 11. Uh, which is a quote, by the way, from the 53rd Psalm. So if you're reading Romans 10, 3, 10 to 11, you're reading... Psalm 53, 1 to, th 1 to 3. Paul quotes a psalm and he says, As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. See, there's the intellect that, that the mind has been corrupted. And the last line, no one seeks for God. Our wills have been corrupted so much that we refuse to seek after Christ on our own, left to ourselves. We will never seek for Christ. If you're wondering what Jesus thought about all this, jot down John 6, 44. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, that's what Jesus said. He said, no one can come, to, can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So you have no ability of your will to seek for God on your own. Dr. Lawson, in his book, writes, he concludes, he says, we spiritually cannot choose what is right before God Therefore, every capacity, the mind, emotions, and will of every person has been devastated by Adam's sin. Every part of every man and woman is polluted by sin. Again, it doesn't mean we all act as evil as we possibly can. That's not what total depravity means. It means every part of every man and woman is polluted and corrupted. By sin. So in and of ourselves, without God intervening in our lives, we will not seek the light. There are no exceptions to this. Now, look at the text again. I want you to see how all-encompassing this is. The, you know, when we, um, when we think about uh, sin, we like to think about somebody else. But here's what Paul says. He says, look at chapter 2 again, verse 1. And you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So he's writing to the, these Christians in Ephesus. You, you were dead, were, past tense, but that's what you were. And then he says, um, verse 3, he says, among whom 
What's, what's the next two, if you have the ESV, among whom, what are the next two words? Among whom we all, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the, of the mind and by nature children of the wrath. What is the last phrase of verse 3? Like the rest of mankind. You see, there are no exceptions to this. The you, the we all, and the rest of mankind close the case. There aren't any exceptions. This is everybody. This is you. This is you. God says, I'm talking about you. He's also talking about me. He's talking about all of us. Why is it important to pinpoint that? Here's why. As we see Paul's flow of thought move through chapter chapter 2, we're going to see an argument develop for the unity between two opposing groups, Jews and Gentiles. And by showing the universal problem of sin that has permeated every single human being, regardless, regardless of their uh, race or ethnicity, Paul's proving that one group isn't better than the other One group isn't more righteous or more naturally close to God than the other. Paul is declaring our common moral history as simply members of the human race. It's a history that predates, are you ready? It predates our ethnic and racial or socioeconomic history. It's a history that reaches back to everybody's daddy, Adam. And the sin he committed in the Garden of Eden, which we committed in Adam, because we are all in Adam when we're born. And therefore, we all have the same spiritual ancestor and the same spiritual diagnosis. Everyone is dead in sin, needing reconciliation with God, and the only means is the cross of Christ. And Paul's point is, there isn't any difference. You read Romans 3, he says the same thing. What have we said? There's no difference. We have, all, we have concluded that we're all under sin. But his, what it, the application he's going to make here is that if we have the same moral history, regardless of our ethnicity, our race, our whatever else, he's saying you have a common moral history that makes you all equal, all equally dead in sin. And if the same answer if the answer to your spiritual death is the same no matter what you are, what ethnic background or race or, or ec- socioeconomic educational background, if, the, if the, um, the cure, if the solution is the same across the board, then what he's saying is you don't have a spiritual leg to stand on. You're all crippled, but I know the person who can heal you but he, and he heals anybody who will come to, to him in faith. But you won't do it unless God brings it about because you're dead in sin. And so there, what he's saying is there's, you have so much in common, so much in common with your moral history in the past and the person of Jesus who can save you. There's more in common about you than you realize, which makes you, makes you have more in common... Uh, uh, so that you can be unified rather than what you have in differences with each other that, make, that might make you split apart. So you may be Jew and Gentile. He's, I'm talking about first century context here. You may, there may be Jews and Gentiles in the church, and if you know anything about the history of Jews and Gentiles in the first century, uh, that wasn't pretty. But they both came to know Christ, and they were both in the church, and Paul is saying... Look, you have the same moral past, it's dead in sin, and you have the same Savior, so you have more in common to bring you together in unity than you have as differences that would keep you apart. So focus on that which unites you rather than what divides you. And and if you read this week, the rest of chapter 2, you're going to come across this verse that says, He himself is our peace who has made us both one. Made us both, Jew and Gentile, both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And he has, in verse 18, that he might reconcile us both to God in one body. 
And the whole point there is, if God has reconciled you together in one body, then now you can use that unity to express that in your relationships with one another. You see, theology is always at work. And you may say, well, you know, really not struggling with the Jew-Gentile issue these days. That's right. But is there any struggle going on in our nation right now? Racially? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. So this text is as relevant as tomorrow's newspaper. We need this. So, what would you think of a doctor who knew that you were dying of a fatal disease for which there was a cure? What, what, if, what, if, what would you think of a doctor who knew you were dying of a fatal disease for which there was a cure, but he didn't want to upset you? He, he didn't want to upset you with any bad news about you, you know? You know, and he him hauls around, or she him hauls around about it. Wouldn't you prefer to go on uh, with him or her saying, "Sit down. It's not pretty. It's really not pretty. But there is a cure. There's one cure. I'm going to tell you about it. See, we would want to know the bad news. We would want to know that." We would not want to be blissfully ignorant that we are dying when, in fact, there was a cure, but the doctor didn't want to upset us. You see, this is the temptation that you and I face every day with people around us in our interactions with them. <laughs> we don't want to upset them. <laughs> we... And I'm not one to, you know, flick a, you know, a chip off somebody's shoulder either. I'm not looking to pick a fight. But the good, the good news won't be good until the bad news is understood. And somehow we have to make it clear to people. And the love, truth in love. <laughs> you know, don't point your finger, you know, at them and, you know, yeah. you. When you know your own history, you're less likely to do that. You just point them to the problem and the remedy. But we would want a doctor to tell us what is the diagnosis and then what is the cure. God has spoken to us about our spiritual cancer. And the diagnosis is devastating. And it's hard for us to hear. It's hard for me to preach it. But let me tell you, this is the first step toward the kingdom. Remember the, the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus said when he opened the Sermon on the Mount? Remember he started out with those blessed words? What was the, what was the first blessed person? Who, who was the first blessed person in the Sermon on the Mount? Who was that person? Blessed are the what? Poor, the poor in spirit. And then he said, blessed are those who mourn. Then he said, blessed are the meek. And then he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why did he say that? He said that because of the truth here. He's saying, blessed are you who have come to an understanding of that you don't have anything in your moral bank account except a debt that you can never repay. Blessed are you who come to grips with your spiritual poverty. Blessed are you who have come to understand you got, you're clothed in spiritual rags. Blessed are you who have come to understand the only thing you have to offer God is your sin. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit. You see, that's what, that's what this text does. It tells us the poverty of our spirit. And, and it doesn't stop there. Not only... Does he say, blessed are those who are poor in spirit? Then he says, blessed are those who mourn. See, when we come to grips with our spiritual poverty and the sin that, that we live in, in living death, and, and, and that dawns on us because God puts his finger on us and he touches us and he, he 
brings us alive and he shows us and we begin to see ourselves, the, one of the first things that we do is that we mourn. You know, I don't think anybody comes skipping into the kingdom. I don't think we, ha, 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 into the kingdom. I think we come, Jesus said, they mourn. But we mourn into the kingdom. We come to grips with our sin is a, is a process of mourning. We, we're exposed. We're guilty. And so we're mourning over it. And it's no wonder that he says, blessed are the meek. Why would we, why would we come to, to God in pride? Listen, you have pride? There, you don't have a place in the kingdom. Pride, the, do, the door to the kingdom is what? Is it, is it wide? He said, wide is the gate. Broad is the road that leads to destruction and many are on it. He says, narrow is the door. Narrow is the door that leads to life and few find it. And the reason is, is because you don't come in puffed up with a big head and a chest puffed up. You come, you come in meekness. You come small. You come into the kingdom small and mourning and, and knowing your, your checkbook is, is in the red with God, so to speak. And you come hungering and thirsting after righteousness because you know that is what you don't have. You don't have that. You don't have righteousness. But you know who can give it to you. See, And it is because of that that we squeeze in spiritual poverty and mourning and, and meekness through that narrow door into life, into the life that God so freely gives. <clears throat> Do you understand why Paul is, is, when he gets to verse 4 and he is like, but God, oh, but God, being rich in mercy. There's a reason why he exclaims, oh, God, such mercy, because he's clarifying for us who we are. Now, as we finish, there's, there's two more parts to this diagnosis, okay? He's not even done yet. And what I'm going to do, Lord willing, next week, <coughs> finish, and then I want, I want to draw out, give enough time for implications of all this. What are the implications if this is true, then what else is true? That, that's what I want to draw out and, and try to be as clear as possible this uh, next Sunday, Lord willing. We need to see the implications then of, of these truths about our diagnosis. And when we finish that, then God willing, the following Sunday, <clears throat> we'll look at the good news and we'll see the bright, shining Son of God in all his glory and what, and what he has done for us and how God has displayed his power. But for now, I want to ask you, have you come into the kingdom? Have you ever mourned? Have you ever saw your, the poverty of your own spirit? Have you ever mourned? Have you ever lamented wasted time, wasted years, wasted resources, wasted opportunities? Oh, God. See, your eyes get opened, and, you, and suddenly you see what you, God's been seeing all along, and you say, oh, and you mourn it, you lament. And, and, and then you're humbled. Have you ever been humbled? And then, and then have you ever cried out, God, give me righteousness, give me the righteousness of Jesus? If God is talking to your heart today, wow, praise God. Let, let that voice sink into your heart and cry out to him for mercy. He will save you. He will save you through the blood of his son and the resurrection of his son. Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, I give you praise and thanks for all that is said here. And it's so humbling. It just takes our breath away. I pray, may we tremble before your word. May we tremble before the truth of your word. May we come to grips with more and more of what you said and then rejoice more and more in your grace. Lord, speak to hearts. Draw people to yourself. 
Wake them up from spiritual death. Raise, raise them up and grant faith to them to believe, to trust in Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.